Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a beautiful, smoking hot day. And what better day to, way to cool off than a couple ice cold coats? So we got some corn behind us here. And of course, my lovely wife, Jenny and I, we are going for a crop tour tonight. And of course, you gotta have a Coke. So grab your Coke and hang out with us. We're going on a crop tour. Welcome to the Red River Valley of North Dakota. A land flowing with milk and honey. You're watching Beet Farmin' Mitch. Oh, we got the Scottsdale, we got Jenny, we got a couple cooks, and what do we got here, Jenny? Corn. Uh-oh. I think you got a friend. <gasps> oh my goodness. You don't want that, do you? Well, I mean, if I see a, a, like an odd grasshopper or something, I'm not too worried about it. So we're right by the side of a field. This is a great question, actually. So we're right kind of by the edge of the field. And so grasshoppers typically kind of live on the edge of the field. Here where there's this road grass, and sometimes they'll kind of hop on. And so as long as it's not like majorly far into the field, you know, and it's not like it's causing a whole bunch of damage. So well, let's go further in then. Yeah, let's go check it out. So for North Dakota corn, I mean, I'm pretty pleased. This doesn't look too shabby in here. Didn't they used to say knee high by the 4th of July? Things have changed a little since Yes, now. they have. I would say if you have knee high by the 4th of July corn, it's probably a pretty poor corn crop. <laughs> so this was probably like waist high or something. About 5'4". It's really amazing how fast corn grows. It really is crazy. So we can take a look here. And so corn up on top, we got the tassels up there. And we've got the cobs down here. So that is the male part of the plant, and this is the female part of the plant. And so each plant is actually this, a male and a female. It is monoecious, is what it's called. Some plants are both, like, the one will be male, one will be female. Uh-oh, I'm losing Jenny in the corn. So we've got 22-inch row spacing here, and so that's what we plant our sugar beets in, so our corn, that's kind of what we do up here as well. Just enough to hang out in here. We might lose our way in here. We might not find our way back. I actually haven't walked out here in a while and with how tall it is, I mean, you drive by on the road and you think it looks pretty good, but I'm actually pretty impressed with how tall this corn is here. This is some 87 day corn. We're up in North Dakota, so it's not like we can grow 100 plus day corn up here. Oh no, look, another friend. So we'll peel a cob off and see what we got shaken. And so this is field corn. This is not sweet corn. So this is not what you buy on a road stand not what you buy in the grocery store. This is more like for ethanol or different kinds of foods like tortillas, not sweet corn per se. It's a different type of corn known as field corn or dent corn. So here we got a field corn cob. I remember when I was a kid, they would always sell sweet corn in town and my dad would pick up sweet corn for our family for lunch or whatever in the summer. And he'd always throw a field corn cob in there. And then somebody would try to take a bite and it was just like super hard. And it was, it was somebody would get a laugh out of it. Oh no, the pickup's gone. What? Most people don't know how to drive a stick shift. I don't think it would be gone. Uh, so fun fact about this pickup, right? So I kind of like two years ago, I had a hankering to have a classic pickup so me and the wife can drive around and check crops and go on dates and stuff like that. And so I was in church one day and I was kind of like thinking like, man, I wish I had a classic pickup like during the sermon or whatever. And I'm like, nope, Lord, I should stay focused. I should listen to what the preacher's saying. And so I kind of let go of it, forgot about it, whatever. A week later, one of my buddies called me, my buddy Zach. And he said, hey, remember you were saying you wanted a classic pickup a couple months ago or whatever? Well, my grandpa said he'd be willing to part with the 1978 Chevy Scottsdale pickup. Her. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, holy smokes, like, I, it just, it fell from heaven. It really did. And you know, I needed a little elbow grease and things like that, and I got a good deal on it, and so really put a lot of work and time and effort into this puppy over the last year, and now she's dialed in for making some mems. But anyway, it's hot, enough chit-chat, I think we should go to the next crop. Buttercup, better hop out, we're at our next crop. Out in a wheat field, 
Sometimes we just look so soft, I want to lay in it. But it's really a little pricklier it's than a person thinks. It's kind of itchy, actually. <laughs> So we're out in a hard red spring wheat field here, so meaning we planted it in the spring and we're gonna harvest it in the fall. And we're not too far away from harvest. You can kind of see it's starting to get a little of that golden color to it. And this is kind of a good sign here. You see how this is kind of laying a little down a little bit? Usually means a little thicker, a little heavier wheat here. I like to see that uh, because earlier this year we had a heck of a wheat year. We had such a, a dry a period of time following planting. And when it's dry and hot, wheat does not like that. So anyway, our wheat around the countryside was looking not very good at all. And so we actually ended up getting some late June rains and it kind of bounced back. And I'm kind of in disbelief a little bit. So it really kind of, it started heading out early, but it's just kind of been staying alive for so long. So it's gonna be interesting to see what we find in our wheat fields this year. And so it's actually a little damp. There's good moisture in the ground here now. Two days ago, what, what I would have said, how the crops look well, I would have said, the crops are looking pretty good for the most part. Uh, but it is very dry. There is minimal moisture in the ground. It's dry and things are gonna probably start going backwards soon. But guess what happened last night? The rain came. Going from one side of the house looking out the window watching the rain to the other side of the house looking out the window watching the rain. For 15 minutes that man would not sit down. But we've been praying for rain so we praise God for that. Yes, the rain doesn't come from me that's for sure. So anyway we got an inch of rain on pretty much most of our fields and I am very happy and thankful about that. Um, so the ground has actually got some good moisture content in it. Uh, the wheat is maturing. I mean, it's going to be it's starting to brown up and mature before too long. Uh, hopefully these heads fill out a little bit more. Honestly, I don't know what to expect. This field looks pretty good. This was soybeans last year and I've got wheat here and it's looked fairly good throughout the whole year. It was a little short when it started heading out, but honestly, I'm pretty confident I'll get a close to average crop here. It's hard to know until you send the combine through, but I'm still optimistic that this is gonna turn out to be a pretty good crop. So something I've been learning is the difference between wheat and barley, because from the road, it's a little hard to see. We don't have any barley fields nearby that we could compare, but Mitch could probably tell us. So this is kind of what I told Jenny. So when you plant barley and wheat, it's kind of hard to tell coming up, but if you have them right next to each other, typically the barley is gonna have longer ons, they're called, they're really long. Um, and so you can kind of tell the difference from the road a little bit when they're heading out. The wheat kind of looks a little like less fluffy. The barley looks a little fluffier and longer. And so that's kind of, it may be a little more lime green. And you know what? There is actually a barley field a few, couple miles that way. Maybe we can swing by there in a bit. beans in this field here. You can tell they're pintos by the way they are. No, I'm just kidding. You tell they're pinto beans, their leaves are a little pointier and they got these stringy tops. At least that's how I can tell. I don't know, what about you, Mitch? Yeah, I think that's pretty sums it up. I remember early on in Jenny and I's relationship, uh, the differing of a soybean and a pinto bean. And those were kind of the two points that I kind of gave you for differing them. And we kept the actual beans from that field and I think I still have them. That's, <laughs> wow, that's pretty cute, I like that. You can see so, so, uh, a lot of these are flowering and actually if you dig a little bit deeper, what do we got there, schmoops? <gasps> a little pod. Yeah, Can't crack her open. It? Yeah, see what's inside. What if there's nothing? Well. I'm not doing a good job, I might need another one. Okay, I can get, there's, there's more to go around. Well, here, I'll show you this. This guy. Oh, look at that pinto bean. Look at a little baby pinto bean. Would it be wrong to eat them? I, you know, I don't think so. He's a little tart. <laughs> so oh, man. So this field, we're actually, we row cultivated, and this is my brother's field here. He's a good farmer. He's got some good beans out here. You can't complain with that. And a couple interesting things we got going on in this field. So we're gonna knife this one, right? So we row cultivated it, and if you look up here, kind of there's a little gap here. Uh, you can see there's kind of a hill in the middle. So our knife is actually gonna go like kind of in between and slice that, because you kind of want to have a hill on. We're gonna take a look at this spot. So when we were row cultivating, we are trying to be really careful not to cover up these little beans. And you know, you can just see how far apart they are in their growth. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. We wanted to not cover them up because we didn't have to. I don't know if they're gonna make it. You know, they're, this one here, if you take a look at this, so this is the very first uh, two leaves that 
uh, pinto bean plant shoots off, the first two true leaves. Then you got the first trifoliate here and the second trifoliate and then that third trifoliate's coming down there. So we're pretty far along in the season. It's almost the end of July and I just, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with some of those this year, but the, most of the field looks really good. Most of the beans are here. So I think this, I mean, this will be a good crop if things continue to move forth at a normal rate. So good to see, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen with those little ones this year. The crop of crops. This is not lettuce. These are some pretty big sugar beets if I ever did see them. I don't want to pull them out though. Oh, it's all right. Do you think pull I Pull them out, let her up. Just like this one? Yep. This is your sugar beet, Oh hun. my goodness, dude. It's yeah, you can do it. Just put a little mustard in it. A little mustard, a little vinegar. Ah! This is not a garden beet, this is a sugar beet, and that is why it is white. There's like sugar. What? Oh, you got a little dirt on your lips. I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we've looked at corn, we've looked at wheat, we've looked at pinto beans, and now we're gonna take a look at sugar beets. And so we're right on a dirt road here. Farm both these sides. This side is uh, crystal beet seed. This is non-CR plus, right? And this side is CR plus, right? And the CR plus stands for Sacospora resistant. So I'm really excited about that because Sacospora is a leaf disease that can cause major problems, right? And so Sacospora, if it was on here, you'd see like little uh, brown circles. And then if you see a field turning brown, that means it's really gotten hold. And that's not a good situation. It causes the sugar percent to go down big time. Um, I mean, you can still harvest them and they're good beets that can have sugar out of them. It's just, you know, your sugar percent drops because the plant's kind of trying to stay alive more. But anyway, let's take a quick look at these. So, I mean, that's a pretty good beet. You know, we're going to start pre-harvest before long, um, kind of towards the end of August, and it is the end of July. So about one month, I'm pretty sure that these are going to be some pretty good looking beets here. Nice white taproot. Um, and you can see that when we're in a dry time, these roots, they can go way down there for water. So that's a really good plus about growing sugar beets is they're pretty consistent in terms of, you know, they can handle some, they're hardier, I should say. They're, they're really some hardy good plants. Um, and you can see our nice black soil there too. And so really the only difference between these is that these are more Sacospora resistant than the other side. This, is, this field has an excellent stand, right? So that means that all the plants that were planted here came up really good. There was a couple spots that didn't come up quite as good, this spot being one of them. Again, very small local spots in these fields. Not adding up to much, but you can see how these beets are kind of behind. And, you know, tiny little beet there. Hopefully those bulk up enough so they don't get shot through the lifter. But again, I mean, we're talking like a tiny little, like, 30 feet by 40 feet, you know, rectangle. There's not much. There's a lot of fields that look like the whole field has that, unfortunately. Well, I think it's time. Good old drone flying. So as you can see here, this field is the CR plus sugar beet field. You can see that the rows look nice and full. I mean, there's a little couple holes here and there, but overall that looks really good. I'm really happy to see that. And it's really amazing when you're flying a drone, what you can see from the air. We're gonna go take a look at the other field. I know the other field, the stand was all right, but there is definitely a couple more holes out in that piece. So these beets here, you can see how there's just kind of a little bit more holes in them. It started getting dry by the time we got to planting this field. So, I mean, it still looks pretty good, still pretty happy with that, but you can definitely see a couple more gaps and you definitely see them a lot more from the air. You know, from the road, this field looks full and lush, but there's definitely a couple more holes out here. push buttons. They don't make them like they used to. We 
you're in luck. I'm in luck. So Jenny was asking about barley and wheat other earlier, and this isn't our field, but we happen to find this is wheat and that is barley. So what do you think the main visual differences are? Barley is much fluffier. Yep, I would agree. Definitely looks fluffier. That's the barley over there. That's the wheat over there. It's kind of almost more lime green too. And you know, it depends on what stage you look at it, but there you go. There's an eye to eye comparison, barley versus wheat. And you kind of, you get an eye for these things as time goes on and you kind of can see it a little bit easier as you experience it. Well, I think we need to do more country cruises. Well, I think we do too, but I think we still got a grand finale to finish this puppy off. I know what we're doing. I do too. I am, I got the flamethrower here. Anytime we go anywhere, I will get anything deluxe. Yep, I can vouch on that. That is truthful. Cheers. Cheers. Well, we're gonna eat our food. We're gonna enjoy our DQ and our view. But you better buckle up, because here comes the drone. Wow, this is beautiful. Ready to jump in? Oh man, I wasn't ready for that one. I got my swimming boots on. Okay. All right, ready? You're up. Three, two, one. This is Beat Farm and Jenny. And Beat Farm and Mitch. And don't forget to keep it sweet. sweet.